Welcome back to the Cross Line Podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed part one of our um, the Cross Line Podcast interview where we, where we talked about the business side. Now we're going to get into something more uh, personal, something that's uh, super important to everybody. It should be important to everyone. Um, Paul, you say you built a successful business, but aside of that, you you have a very philanthropic spirit. You like help you help fight for a lot of um, serious causes that are going on into the world. So can you go ahead and just dive in and talk about how did you actually get into your your philanthropic side of, of everything? Here, here's what I think is side. super important when it comes to being a business owner and entrepreneur. If you make a decision today, when you know, somebody's just starting out their, their business, they're just barely starting to build their entrepreneurial side of things, everything. If you make a decision when you're just getting started that a large percentage, for me, my, my decision was I was gonna donate up to 20% of my time and 20% of my money to making a significant impact in the lives of other people, mm -hmm. right? And you have to figure out what that is to you. You know, whether it's whether it's it's fighting for for equal rights, whether it's 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 helping the poor, whether whatever it is, whether it's saving the trees, saving the wells, saving the kids, whatever it is, find something that you're passionate about and decide that you're not just going to help that cause when you're rich. Decide to help that cause now. And I believe this is what happened to me. I believe that. The majority of your success as you move forward in your business career and building your company and everything else, the majority of that success will come and will be enhanced because of that one decision. So I made that decision in my early 20s. I had a mentor that said, Paul, there's a lot of wealthy families that, that they started out when they were broke with making this one decision that they were going to give a significant percentage of their money to time money on time to charity and uh, you can call it you can call it the universe you can call it karma you can call it god you can call it whatever you want there's a higher power very interested in you and i doing good right mm -hmm. and there's massive blessings that will come into your life not only in your heart in your fulfillment but financially as well Okay, how does somebody become a partner, let alone a co-founder of a $43 billion company? You're not a University of Utah dropout, right? right. The, the statistical probability of me being where I am is zero. And the only way to do that is you, you, go, to, you go to Harvard, you get a JDB, JD MBA, you, you go to New York, you start at the bottom, you start kissing button, maybe, maybe you become partner. The only way that I can understand the success that I had in my companies is the fact that I made that decision in my early 20s that I would donate a lot of time and money to charity. Now, for me, what happened is I didn't know where to start. So I'm like, okay, um, uh, charity, uh, homeless people, that's the only charity I knew of at the time. Mm -hmm. you know. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go downtown, I'm going to take a bunch of cash and hand it to people that are on the side. Maybe I'm gonna take a bunch of food. And I remember one time we took the kids and they were, we had a bunch of pizzas and we were, we rolled down the windows and we were handing out pizzas to the, the guys in the, in the homeless area. They were handing out a piece of pizza to each one and just teaching the kids charity. And it was a horrible experience because what happened is all of a sudden these guys started reaching in to grab the entire boxes of pizzas out of my kids' hands, ripping them out of my kids' hands, fighting with each other, throwing a bunch of F-bombs around. I'm like, are you kidding me? I rolled up the windows. I said, screw this. So for me, what I decided that I wasn't interested in giving a lot of money to a 40-year-old man who made bad decisions and now he's asking me for drug money, right? right. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, a child in a position completely outside of her control. You know, somebody, the child that was dying of cancer or, you know, is, was kidnapped or whatever. If That's where I wanted to focus my time. So I donated time. I was actually, when I was first starting out, was at the Primary Children's Hospital. I, I donated time with One Life at a Time and, and the Ronald McDonald House and a lot of different charities that I would go and, and spend some time with. I started working with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Make-A-Wish helps grant wishes to children who have life-threatening illnesses. And that was super fulfilling to me because these kids, they, they didn't spend their whole life smoking to end up having cancer, right? right. They didn't ha spend their whole life making whatever decisions it was. It just happened. 
And so I was pouring everything into there. And, and when I was a kid, I wanted to be a, a, a pediatric cardiologist, a heart surgeon on children. As we are now fast forward, my big passion today, and we can talk about how I got into it, my big passion today is, is, is not just rescuing a 10-year-old from the clutches of a trafficker in, in South America somewhere. It's, it's helping rescue the 10-year-old inside of every man, woman, and child who had some trauma earlier in their life that they need to figure out how to get rid of so that they can move on and live the life of their dreams of abundance without all of these anchors that are holding them back. Would you say that was something that's always um, been in you, um, even at a young age, before you even came into money, was something that's like, you know, standing up for other people or helping them try to like relieve their trauma? Was it, would you say that was something that was always in you from an early age? I, I believe so. I believe so. I was the oldest of five children. I had uh, four younger sisters, and I was always looking out for them. They were looking out for me, too. But... Um, um, and because I was picked on sometimes when I was a kid, I, 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 I felt this, this, this need to help other kids that were in that position. And I never did see people as lower than me just because they didn't have the same income or the same skin color or the mm -hmm. same religion or anything else. I never did. I, 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 I never did understand how somebody would see themselves. And so I was there to help the underdog in any, any area that I could. Absolutely. You know, talking about, you know, the, uh, the sex trafficking and, and, you know, helping fight for those causes. Um, can you elaborate on like, how did you get into that portion of, you know, you know, fighting that cause and how serious is it? Because I remember, I recall when I first really started hearing about it, I was, it was my um, freshman year in college and freshman or sophomore year in college and I had took pub public speaking and one young lady, she came up there and she was talking about it. You know, I was 19, 20 at the time. I didn't really understand the seriousness of it. But, you know, she came in there, you know, she spoke about it from the heart and she gave out certain st statistics. How serious is that, you know, the, the sex trafficking um, of just overall? Here, here's, here's what it is, Carlos. Human trafficking today is worse than it's ever been in history. Mm -hmm. there, there's more today. And I'm not talking about just children being abused at home, which is horrible. And we're going to talk about that. I'm talking sold human beings. There's more today than all 300 years of the transatlantic slave trade put together. Mm. Now, good people think that slavery disappeared at the time of Abraham Lincoln. It's not. It, it, it went dark. It went underground. It went. It went to children, and it's unfortunate that people throughout all of history have ever believed that it was okay to own another human being. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's appalling to me. It's mm -hmm. appalling. In fact, one of the people that I emulate, that I, that I admire in history, uh, was a guy by the name of William Wilberforce. William lived back in the 1700s. This was, this was before the U.S. even became a, a country, right? And he was over in Europe, and he had seen slavery firsthand. And, and at, at his time, it was, most of the world was legal that you could own another human being. It was just horrible that oh. people would think that, right? And he had seen it firsthand, and he was a, he was a wealthy, well-spoken, connected businessman who had seen this travesty firsthand. And so he was thinking, how do I fix this? How do I fix this problem? So he thought, you know what? I can't just go lobby for it. I've got to get people to see it. I've got to get them to see it firsthand. So he would have dinner parties on his yacht, and in the middle of this dinner party, he would have the captain of his ship or yacht, whatever they were in the 1700s, take this ship and go and park it next to the slave ships. And the sound of the chains and the screaming and the smell of the blood and everything he would shake up his, his pompous ass crowd and they would say, oh, what's going on? And then he would pull it away and he'd say, okay, now let's talk about this. Let's talk about really, really what's going on, okay? So what my hope is in this podcast today I have led or been a part of over 70 undercover rescue missions to rescue children in 15 countries and countries all around the world. And I have seen this travesty firsthand. 
And so I'm not going to take your audience physically there to see it, but I'm going to emotionally take them to that darkness so that we can pull away and say, okay, let's talk about healing. Let's talk about the light. Let's talk about really what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And so, so there is, um, there's a lot of different numbers in terms of child trafficking alone. People believe it's somewhere between 8 million and 10 million children, average age of 12 years old, being brought into child sex slavery today. Oh. It's, it's a huge number. Human trafficking as a whole is, is over four times that, mm. you know, with over 40 million, which is just a huge number. And so, and, and it's growing faster today than it ever has. So I've realized that just doing the undercover isn't going to fix the problem. I've got to change the hearts and the minds of the people. I've got to do what William Wilberforce did. I, I've been in the pit of hell. I have seen it firsthand. I can take this podcast, this dinner party ship that we have, and I can take it and I'm going to park it next to the slave ship. And I'm going to help people see really what's going on to touch their hearts in a way where they can say, okay, we as a world can come together on this. We might not come together on, on global warming. We might not come together on you know saving the trees. We might not come together on politics. We might not come together on these things. This is something we can all come together on. And mm -hmm. we can all together as a world can eradicate this problem. Absolutely. And not straying away from the subject, but it's like almost like like you were saying, you have to see these type of things for people to, to like pull on their emotions. Almost like uh, when the pandemic happened with the George Floyd incident, when, when people saw that, it made them, you know, want to fight for a cause. Or even a couple months ago with the DeMar Hamlin situation with the Buffalo Bills, when people saw him out there on the field laying there almost, um, almost near death, it pulled people together. So it's yeah. almost like when you see these type of things, it helps unify people. To, to help fight for a great cause. Absolutely. I want to ask you, um, so for you, was it something that you saw personally, like I had a personal, um, not maybe it not happened to you or somebody close to you that wanted, made you want to fight for this cause? What, what made you just like gravitate towards it and yeah. just dive in and help? Here, here's what happened. So 10 years ago, uh, uh, Sean Reyes, he's the attorney general in Salt Lake. Okay. Um, he, uh, he and I became pretty good friends. I, I had won uh, something called 40 Under 40 the year before he did. That's the 40 most influential people under 40 years old. He was young attorney of that, the year for the entire nation. I had built a multi-billion dollar company, real estate company. And uh, he called me and he said, Paul, he said, I know that you donate a lot of money and time to child-related charities. And at the time, I was the incoming chairman for Make-A-Wish here in, in the Utah area. And he said, I know you do a lot for children. He said, I need to talk to you about something that's, that's pretty difficult to stomach. He said, it's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. It's now the second most profitable. It surpassed the illegal arms trade, and it's soon going to surpass the drug trade. Because you can, you can sell a cocaine, bag of cocaine once. You can sell a child 10, 20 times a day for 10 to 15 years. And I'm like, what? People sell, that still exists? Slavery exists? He goes, Paul, he says, it's massive and it's everywhere. And he, I said, well, what do you need? How can I help? And he introduced me to a, a guy who was a Homeland Security agent that had, had seen the children firsthand. He was trying to pull together some money for a private rescue to pull some children out of, out of sex slavery in Colombia. And uh, so he, he introduced me to him, and I helped to put some guys together to help write some checks for that. And then um, a few weeks later, he called me, and he said, Paul, I'm in Colombia. There's not just 20 children in Cartagena. There's more than 50, and there's more than 100 children tied to this same trafficking ring or others like it in the surrounding cities, over 100 he said, we have a plan that we could rescue all 100 children at the same time, on the same day. And I said, what do you, how much do you need? What, how can I help? And then he said, I need you. I said, you mm. need me? He said, yeah, can you be in Colombia in two days? I said, well, what can I do? He said, the head trafficker down here has an island that he inherited from his mom that he wants to develop it into a Jeffrey Epstein type 
island, a sex traffic island for children to say have wealthy guys come down. He has this business plan that he can make tens of millions of dollars a year off of this this plan. And uh, he, he, I said, well, how can I help with that? He said, well, I can't teach my Navy SEALs how to negotiate a multi-million dollar real estate deal. He said, that's what you do in your, in your business career. He said, you fly down here, you meet with these guys face to face. You tell them, listen, I'm willing to fund your development under one condition. We're gonna have a party in a couple weeks. I'm gonna bring down a bunch of my rich buddies. They're into kids. You bring all the kids you have access to and any of your other buddies you've got access to and I'll, I'll, fund, I'll fund your project if I'm impressed. And so my, my business partner called me because he, he heard about it from my other business partner. And he said, he said Paul, he said, have you, have you thought through this? He said, he said, this is super dangerous. He said, you're set. You could, you could sell out today and buy, a, buy an island of your own and be happy the rest of your life. And I said, John, would I really be happy? I said, tell me this. If, if, I was, if I was doing something else dangerous tomorrow, if I was climbing Everest tomorrow, you and I would have the same conversation. He goes, yeah, we probably would. I said, when I'm 95 years old and I look back on my life and I say I climbed this mountain and I built this multi-billion dollar company and I helped rescue this many children, which one of them matters? He said, yeah, you're right. I said, I said I've got some skills that they need. I, I, I need to go. So I, I flew down to Columbia. I'm, uh, uh, they, I get picked up at the airport by these two big Navy SEAL guys. They're my real bodyguards and my, fate, my show bodyguards. We, they take us to this little beach area. These guys are in this restaurant with this overlook overlooking the beach. And they see us drive in in this bulletproof car. And I'm in this $4,000 suit. And I've got a nice watch on and everything. And, and they're like, oh, wow, this is the guy that's going to fund our deal. And I, you know, we walk upstairs. And, and I'm sitting there at this table. There's three, three men and one female trafficker all there that were selling children. The female used to be Miss Cartagena or something. She had a fake modeling agency. She was going to towns in South America and telling the parents, oh, your daughter should be, you know, she should be a model. She's super pretty. And she was bringing in all these kids. So I'm sitting there at this table negotiating this deal. And, uh, and halfway through, one of the traffickers leans forward. And he goes, Pablo, he goes, I have a gift for you. I said, what's your gift? And he hands me his phone. And there's a picture of an 11-year-old girl on his phone. Mm. He said, this is Princess. She's still a virgin. She, we just took delivery of some. She's my gift for you for this party. And he started talking about these horrible things. I'm like, I could do this little girl. And I thought, oh, this really is happening. It was dark. And, and something he said made me realize he had more than her. I said, Fuego, I said, you, you have more virgins? You go, oh, yeah, I got three or four more. I said, you have to bring those to my party. I'm very interested in those as well. We were. We had to figure out how to get them out. He goes, right. no. He says, they're too expensive. Too expensive? I'm already paying $25,000 for this party. We're paying $500 per child for 50 children just for two hours in the afternoon with him. And he goes, jefe, you already paid $25,000. You want to F a virgin? It's going to cost you extra $2,000, maybe $5,000 for that little one. It's going to cost you maybe $10,000 more. I was so mad. He's talking about these children like they're commodities. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've got my nice suit on. I'm like, you don't think I can afford an extra $10,000? He's like, oh, no, Hefe, no. I said, I want every one of those virgins at the party. I said, they damn well better be virgins when they get there. They're not for you. They're for me. You understand? Oh, yeah, Hefe, the stupid little smile on his face. And then the, then the um, I won't go. That's dark. I'm going to talk about what the female trafficker said then. But we, we, we go back in two weeks later. We, the, the guys meet with the U.S. Embassy and the Colombian federal agents. They provided 40 agents for the, for the sting. Four of them were our, our maids, four of them were our waiters, four of them were our cooks. You know, they weren't very good maids or waiters, but they were armed. Right. <laughs> you know, 25 of them are there to, to storm the party at the right time. Mm -hmm. And these guys showed up in Cartagena with 54 children. And then there was like 38 children in Medellin and a bunch of others in Armenia. So all together, largest child rescue in history that I know of up to that time was 127 children. And so I'm there at the Cartagena one with all these guys, and we, we, uh, these guys show up with all these children. And we put the children in the house in a separate area because so, they're already traumatized enough. We right. don't want them mm -hmm. seeing the guns and people changing money and stuff. So they're in there. 
we're sitting outside at this table and we have to get them to say exactly why the children are there so the children never have to stand trial so we've got undercover cameras everywhere talking about what kids are there what they're willing to do horrible conversation and then we're supposed to uh, ask for tequila and that's our sign that the the, the waiters are going to go back radio in all the special forces right. all the guys are going to come in and, and do the sting we order tequila tequila great and they were supposed to be there within two minutes two minutes passes five ten 15, 20. It was 45 minutes later. Now, here's the problem. Now that we ordered tequila, now the traffickers are like, okay, time to party. I'm going to go get the cocaine. You go get the kids, you know? And I'm like, no, we, we can't have you bringing the kids the cocaine. You know, we need to freaking, where's the sting, right? What's right. going on here? We found out later that one of the ladies who had um, part of the, the um, part of the group that was the Child Protective Services, she was like in charge of that. She slept through her alarm, missed the boat, all this oh. crap. And she wouldn't let him do the sting till she was there. So, I mean, it was like delay, delay, delay. So it was a miracle that, that they had chosen me to come at that time. Not because I'm that smart, but because I had done enough business plans up to that point that I said, guys, you know what? Uh, if you bring out the cocaine in those kids right now, I'm going to get effed up and it's going to be two or three days before I'm thinking straight again, right? I'm super excited about that. Here's the deal. You just proved to me that you could provide what you said you could provide. So let's do a business plan right now. Let's pull all this together. And so I had to bring out a piece of paper and I said, okay, let's talk about what your, what your resort's gonna look like. You know, how's it, and we drew it all out, we figured it out, and then we, we did a business plan in terms of how much money the, the Americans would pay to come down each time. And, and what's, what's horrible is that this business plan penciled like cash flowed. Why? Because very sick people were willing to come down and pay a lot of money for some very sick things. And so we're going through this business plan and finally I'm like, where the crap is the sting? What's going on? So I finally just said, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm gonna, I like this. I like this plan. I'm gonna own 55% if I put the money in. You guys come up with the other 45% split between you guys. Uh, I, I pointed at one of them and I said, hey, I think uh, I think Eduardo's got this, uh, He's been putting this stuff together. He should he should take the lion's share. You know what? You guys figured out. And then boom, they start fighting with each other for the next 20 minutes. They're arguing over who gets the, the most in the middle of their argument. Boom, huge sting happens. These guys all go to prison. And the most beautiful moment of my life was after the agents came, stormed the party, arrested everybody. The Child Protective Services people came in with the children and they started laughing and singing with the children. And that sound of freedom was the most beautiful sound that I ever heard, especially compared to the crying that I heard half an hour before. And so I turned to the, the Attorney General, I said, I said, I, I've spent my whole life making rich people richer. I, I've done a lot of charity work, but there's nothing that compares to this. I wanna make a powerful, positive impact in the world. I said, and now that I've seen this firsthand, this little 11 year old girl was, was standing in front of me with her, she, I was sitting and down. She was no taller than I was as I was sitting down. She was standing up and there was tear stains in her makeup face. And every cell in my body wanted to just hug her and say, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna see your parents again. You know, I couldn't right. say that because it was in the middle before this thing actually happened. And that transformed my life. I decided, you know what? This cannot exist in the same world that I'm living in. It can't. You know, this is something I can pull together resources and people, whatever it takes to fight this evil in every way that I can. So I, I made a decision that day that I would dedicate my life to eradicating human trafficking, especially when it comes to children. So in doing so, I said, what can I do? How can I help? And he said, Paul, he said, unfortunately, the majority of demand for this horrible act in second and third world countries comes from wealthy businessmen in first world countries who look and talk and walk like you. He said, something happens when they get an ego and money and whatever else. He said, so, so he said, if you can, if you can be the bait, I'll change your whole life. So since that time, I've been on or led over 70 undercover rescue missions in 15 countries. And 
through our foundation, that, that one that we started uh, um, back then with, uh, with the Homeland Security agent, we helped them get some new money in and we helped a number of other ones and funded them. Total over 5,000 kidnapped and trafficked children have been uh, rescued and, uh, and returned to their families. But even there, here we are today, where the problem is bigger today than it was when we started. So somehow, this is the only reason I'm going public, is back with the, the, the track that William Wilberforce did. If I can be a, a connected, well-spoken businessman who has seen children in that situation, that I can bring these stories to light and have people say, you know what, not on my watch. What can I do to fix this problem? How can I help? How can I get behind this in a way that can truly transform the world? Absolutely. Did you have to, um, just wonder, throughout, throughout this whole process when they told you that they needed you, did you have to undergo any kind of training to like prepare for these moments I am or, or what did you have to go through I, I had uh, for years and years I had a uh, a prompting that I needed to learn hand-to-hand -hand combat training and gun training things like that I didn't serve in the military but I got really really good at things like uh, like Krav Maga you know regular martial arts is bad to your sensei three points when you kick them in the leg Krav is break to their head to go home to your family. It's Israeli special forces, hand-to-hand -hand combat training. It's one of the most lethal on earth. And every move, they don't talk, they don't walk, they don't see, they don't have their gun anymore. You know, it's, it's, it's street fighting at its best with the special forces training there. And so, so a lot of these ops, I've got um, not only myself with the training I have, but a lot of guys that understand that. But in addition to that, the, um, <laughs> there's a funny story of where it came from in the beginning. So. Two years before that, I, uh, I, I, I called my friend, Sean, who later became the attorney general, and I said, bro, I said, I got, I got front row tickets to the Miss America pageant in, uh, I think it was in Atlantic City. I said, I said you want to come with me? And his exact words were, Hutch, unlike you, I have an, a reputation to uphold. He said, he said, I can't be front row, Miss America. I said, no, it's not like that. I said, I said, me and a friend of mine who was one of the founders of Yahoo, uh, he and I have sponsored some children who lost their, their dads in military battle this last year. And we're having them come and we're having them be crowned Miss America on stage, these little girls. Wow. You know, we paid for their dresses and their hair. And Sean's like, oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, I'll come with you. So he comes out. And after three days, and, and because it was a fallen soldier charity, the Pentagon had sent a, a representative down, and a guy by the name of John. And John worked as a recruiter for the CIA for many, many years. And after three days of doing, doing, uh, being there at the, the event, we were at dinner, and John leans forward. There's me and Sean there, and John says, Mr. Hutchinson, I've been watching you for the last three days. And I think your country could use your talents. And I'm like, well, what, what talents are those? You know, I don't know what you're talking. He said, no. He said, he said, I saw you in seconds break down the barrier of communication and and become good friends with a bum on the street, a billionaire, or a runway model. He hmm. said, your ability to break through that. He said, you can you can work the words in a way where you're really likable and easy to understand. He said in the CIA we called it a, you know, a chameleon type personality. He said it's something that that is really hard to find, like 1 in 12 million. He said imagine this. We'll send you to Dubai. We'll line you up with some dirty money guys in Dubai and uh, you become good, their good friends and you turn in some stuff to us and we'll line you up with some real billionaires to make it worth your time. And I'm like I don't know and and his guys called me a couple months later and I, I I actually turned them down. I wasn't that interested in putting my life in danger for some white collar crime guys, right? But then two years later, when Sean, now the Attorney General, he was in a meeting and, and was with um, the Homeland Security guy and it was with uh, Josh Romney, who was Mitt Romney's son. That's a whole other story, but never mind on that. Um, but he, he was he said he uh, um, Tim was saying hey this is kind of what we're looking for we're looking for this profile somebody that can handle themselves in a dangerous situation that can kind of be able to negotiate through from a verbal standpoint but 
play the role of the wealthy buyer of these kids. And, um, and Sean Reyes said, oh, have you ever, have you ever met Paul Hutchinson? And, uh, and Josh said, uh, Paul would be perfect. And, and I told him later, I said, I don't think that's a compliment. You know, if you guys think that I'd be really good under, undercover as a pedophile, you know, that's, that's, a, that's not a compliment. Paul would be perfect for this, right? So that's when um, he made that introduction and I went down and it transformed my life. And so I said, I'm ready, I'm whatever you need. And so I started uh, for the first year, I was going in as the buyer. You know, they would they put together a fake Facebook page profile and everything. These guys would go deep cover, connect with the traffickers, show them my profile, say, this guy's going to come down. He's going to pay for it all. And then when I actually show up, they're like, wow, this is the guy, you know, because I had pictures of me with Ferraris and Lamb all this crap that I didn't want to put on my real Facebook, that they build up this fake Facebook page and, and profile and everything else that was totally legit. Then when I'm under, I go in there to buy the kids, these guys are showing up with all these children and just because that's the kind of thing they do all the time and then after a year i was asked to go deep cover instead of being the wealthy guy who was who was buying i was working for the wealthy guy and we would go down at two in the morning in downtown port-au-prince or downtown mexico city or other areas around the world and connect with the traffickers and have them bring their children, either either would set up the place for the sting where they could go sting them where they are or they bring them out to a party or something like that. But the sad thing about it is that this kind of thing happens every single week. That's the reason why the sting works so well is because it's, it's unfortunately that kind of thing happens every single week all over the world. You said something early. I think you mentioned in the first part of our interview, um, you talking about when you, you, when you catch these guys, you say you still learn to love them. Talk a little bit about that, you know, people doing these terrible things to children, but you still find it in your heart to, like, love them regardless. Like, can you explain it? Yeah, here, here's what I found. Now, let me preface it like this. There's no excuse. There's mm -hmm. no excuse mm -hmm. for their behaviors. It don't, I don't care what happened to them in their life. There's no excuse. And they there's always going to be consequences. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to ensure they never hurt innocence again. Mm -hmm. However... I've come to a realization that if I'm ever, ever judging another human being for anything, you know, there's a million different things they could have been doing to me, you know, taking advantage of me financially, whatever. If I'm ever judging them, there's a 100% chance, 100% chance that I don't have all of the facts. I don't know. I don't know if that guy that turned me down for a, for a business loan or whatever else, I, I don't know if it's... It's because he was taught something about me when he was, I don't know if he had trauma of his own. I don't know if he doesn't have the money. I don't know. I mean, there's a million things there. This guy's selling me children. I don't know if he was raped as a child. I don't know if he, if he was beat every single day. I don't know if he's completely dead broke and his, his grandma's in the hospital and he needs money. I don't know. There's a million things, right? Mm -hmm. So now chances are he's just a really bad person with a lot of bad decisions, right? But I can find it in my heart to love every single person as, as my brother, every single person on earth, in a way where I can feel infinite, unconditional love for them. I can still ensure that they pay for their, their things that they've done wrong mm -hmm. and that they get put in a position where they can't cause harm on people again. That's super important. But I can do it from a place of love. And, and, and because of that, there's not all that negative energy that's there. Now, I love the innocence of the children more. Right. And every one of these kids has, has a right to have a beautiful life. In fact, before that rescue, I had, um, I was at a, I was at my, I had a girlfriend at the time, and she had two kids, two boys that were um, roughly nine and 12 years old. And she was, she was telling me, she said, Paul, I don't want you to go undercover. That's super dangerous. I don't want you to go. That's, uh, have somebody else do it. And her boys were playing with this little girl that was in the neighborhood. I think her name was Jessica. And I, I, said, I said, I went in the other room and said, Jessica, can you come in here for a minute? She came in. I said, tell me this, how old are you? She says, well, I'm 10, almost 11. I said, then what do you do for fun? 
She said, well, I like to sing and I like to dance and I like to, you know, ride my bike. Then I said, and what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, maybe be a dancer or maybe be a nurse. You know, beautiful dreams for a beautiful 10, 11 year old girl. Mm -hmm. And I had her go sit down and go play again. And I turned back to my girlfriend at the time and I said, the little girls that I was shown last week in that foreign country were her age that those guys are selling. And if I don't go back down, she could be sold to somebody. And can you imagine the lives that they're going to live? I said, every one of them have the right to be able to dream, to someday be a nurse, to someday be a dancer, without the fear of having their body being used for these horrible things. And so if that was my little 11 year old, I would give every penny I have to get her out. I would take a bullet mm -hmm. for her. And just because the parents of those children don't know where they are, don't have the resources that I do, doesn't mean that they love them any less. And so if there's something about me that I can go down there and create that opportunity for them to be free, I'm going to do so. Is it hard for you to not react with emotion in these situations because you see these young girls, you see what, what's going on with them. Is it hard to you know keep your emotions in check because it's, when you're around these guys that are doing these horrible things, like it's almost one bad move could just blow the whole operation up. You could get killed or anything. For sure. So is it hard for you to, to keep your emotions in check with all of this going on? Absolutely. The, one of the hardest things in that very first mission was when um, they one of the traffickers got up before the sting happened and he said, Pablo, I have to show you the gifts that I brought you. And he goes in the house where the children were. And he was in there for about 10 minutes, and you can hear some of the children crying. And he came back out, and he had four virgins, scared to death. Three little girls, one little boy. This little boy was a, was a little black boy from, I think he was taken from Haiti. They, he was 11. They gave him cocaine that morning because he was so scared it was going to hurt. I mean, what kind of effed yeah, up monster terrible. thinks that that's attractive? You know, everything in my body wanted to just say, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay. And, and, and it was so hard for me as I'm sitting there in that chair and this little 11-year-old girl standing in front of me with the tear stains in her makeup face. And I asked her, I said, Como se llama? What's your name? And she didn't remember her name. And I'm sure mm. that's because her name wasn't Princess. She was trying to think about what the traffickers wanted her to say, and she was so scared. And, and I just said, es de bien, it's okay. That almost broke me completely. And, and, and I couldn't break because the sting hadn't happened. The agents weren't there yet, you know? And, and what, what hurt the most is how she was looking at me. She thought that I was the guy that was there to hurt her, you know? And I, 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 I so badly wanted to say, hey, I'm your friend, I'm your friend. I couldn't, you know, that was super hard. And, and it's happened so many times. There's a, there's a documentary that they did about one of the rescues we did in Haiti. Um, I went deep cover eight different times. I wanted to cut the head off the dragon in, in mm -hmm. Haiti. We wanted to find the top guys, the top traffickers running the top rings. We found, we found them. We found about nine traffickers. 34 children and this one we actually brought some pretty high-level uh, uh, celebrity people in on this yacht to see the, the rescue so that they could be get behind this movement so I show up on this beach I've got I've got a bunch of I've got 34 children I've got these traffickers and uh, and they were able to see that rescue firsthand from the yacht out there and the traffickers coming and we can go into some more detail on that but at the end of that documentary there's a little girl, she's 14 years old. She's sitting on a rocking chair, she's holding a teddy bear. She was taken when she was seven. Her parents were, were killed in the earthquake in Haiti mm. and nobody knew she was alive at all. The traffickers picked her up in all of the confusion and she was sold for sex 20 or 30 times a day. Okay. for six to seven years and I was the first person to see her it was it was about two o'clock in the morning and we had worked our way up to what I call a level three trafficker these are the ones who physically hold the children in captivity 
And this trafficker sticks a key in this door. It's about four feet wide, about seven feet tall. It's a red, steel, rusted door in a super dangerous area of town. And uh, sticks the key in this door, and it opens up. And the first thing I see is this dirt hallway. And um, there was dimly lit lights and, and cobwebs on them. And to the left was multiple cell doors. No windows, no access other than these small steel doors. And the trafficker sticks a key in one of these, these steel doors, and I see this, it's not even a bed, it's a, it's a steel plank held to the wall with the chain, like that, so you could fold it up, you know. And on this, this steel bed was an was a old, dirty, holy, thin blanket. That's all that was in there that was any comfort whatsoever. And to the left, there was a concrete block. And this little girl was sitting on that concrete block. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have your worst That's enemies. Terrible. It's horrible. And, and I, she looked at me like this blank look in her eyes, like this happens all the time. And down at the end of the hall, there was this queen-size mattress on the ground with condoms everywhere where the unthinkable would happen. That little girl didn't speak for two weeks after we rescued her. And her very first words that she said were, I didn't think anybody would come. Mm. She gave up hope seven years oh, before. Yeah. And why would two guys from Utah show up there at two in the morning to rescue her? We were the first. What makes me so mad is that for seven years, every single man who walked through that door was there to hurt her. We were the first men there that didn't have that intention. You know, mm -hmm. now she's learning to dance. She has a family that's adopted her. There's so many beautiful things ahead of her in her life now. But every one of these children have that story. It's, it's horrible. What what type of treatment do you do you do you give these children? Because after something so traumatic, their not their life is never going to be the same um, after something dealing with something like that. What kind of after you get them rescued, what kind of treatment or help do you um, help give um, these children? And that's the most important part of the rescue. Mm -hmm. You know, pulling them out of hell. That's the easy part. You know, we can do that with a bunch of Navy SEALs and a bunch of undercover guys and cost maybe $2,000 a child average is what it costs to, to rescue them. The real cost and the real work and the real rescue happens after we get them out of that situation. And you can't pull them out of hell and put them into another hell. You can't just throw them into an orphanage that doesn't have, you know, the support and the love. And, and uh, we have found that if the parents reported them abducted, then the parents get them back. It's easy to find them. If they didn't, sometimes the parents were involved. You mm -hmm. know, uh, Southeast Asia and Thailand, more than half the kids that we rescued there uh, were sold by their own families. And you, you, can't, you can't put them back into that family, you know, and get them sold again. And so in those situations, we, we will not go into a country and do those rescues unless there's aftercare already set up. And, uh, you know, a lot of the bigger foundations, the ones that I started with, uh, those guys have their own aftercare already in place uh, a lot of therapists and psychiatrists that are that are helping with the rehabilitation of the children we have other foundations that specifically focus on on paying for adoptions there's thousands of families who are willing to sacrifice the next 10 to 20 years of their life with a challenged child with issues uh, but they don't have the twenty, thirty thousand dollars to pay for the, the legal work and uh, some of the early therapy work to be able to help these kids. And so, that's the most important part and the most expensive part of the rehabilitation. You know, for you, you had to to stay undercover for so long. Like, why was it so important? Of course, you didn't want to blow your cover, but like the importance of you know just staying undercover, just. Going through all of that, like how long? How long was that entire process from the beginning to the end? Or almost ten years. Almost ten years, and you had to remain undercover the the entire time. Was that um talk about the impact that that had on your family? Like how was that? You know, their understanding that you're fighting for a, a greater cause, but what type of impact did that have on on your family? Understanding that you're going to you know go help people in need in dire need. I I think that unfortunately. Um, you know, just like we were talking about with when you're too focused on your business and you don't have the balance, mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, I didn't realize 
until after uh, a 22 year marriage that my wife was um, abused as a child herself. Mm. And that's what's come full circle to me now, is I've come to an understanding that this problem is not just a child that's being sold in a brothel. This, ch this problem affects almost every single household in the world in some way. And the average age of somebody who comes forth and says, remembers or verbalizes and says, I was, I was raped as a child, I was abused as a child. The average age is 52 years old. Mm. So most people grow their entire lifetime holding totally. this trauma inside. And let me, now we're on that, I wanna, I wanna touch on these numbers because this is, this is the reason, this is the reason why I've decided to stop doing the undercover work. I, as I was looking at the numbers and I realized, wow, there's more children being sold for sex today than there was 10 years ago. Am I really making a difference? Or when I go in undercover and we find 10, 20 children, we pull them out of hell and we get them the, the help that they need to overcome their trauma because the demand is still there. Is it really just creating a vacuum in which another 20 or 30 children are sucked into that darkest recesses of hell in a way where they're now being traumatized? And so this is the kind of thing that I had to start asking myself, am I making a difference? So as I looked at the numbers and I realized, okay, I've got, there's, there's one child being sold for sex is completely unacceptable in every way. Mm -hmm. Eight to 10 million children is beyond comprehension. And I, that's, that's, however, that's a really small number compared to the real problem. And the real problem is this, just like the case of, of my ex-wife and so many other people, there are billions of people on earth today who have experienced sexual violence, who have been a victim of sex sexual violence at some time in their life. There are uh, an estimated 40% of all women have been a victim of sexual violence in some way. And one fourth of all women, that, it, that happened as a child under 18 years old. That's, if you estimate there's 8 billion people in the world, 4 billion women, that's a billion women who have experienced sexual violence as a child. Now, with the men, it's less, it's 20% of all men. That means if you're in a room anywhere in the world, especially now here in the US, one out of every five men have experienced, has been a victim of sexual violence. That's Worldwide, that ends up being about 800 million men, hmm. and one fourth of them, 200 million men, experience that under the age of 10 years old. So these, they're, they're growing up with this this generational trauma. 92 percent of people who were abused as a child in that way, it was familial in some way. It was a dad, an uncle, a grandpa, a neighbor, somebody that they knew. Right, and so their their trust level for authority, their trust for other people, was smashed at a very very right. young age, mm -hmm. and their confidence in themselves, and they 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 blame themselves in some way, and they feel dirty, and they feel filthy, and they can't get rid of this trauma, and it shows up in their life in a number of different ways. Either number one, really low self esteem, they're beating themselves up, they're oh this is horrible, or number two, it goes outward and hurts others. They they become physically or verbally or even sexually abusive themselves. And what will happen, they end up growing up and having a big ego and whatever, and they already have this skewed understanding of, of sacred intimacy in a way where they're like blatantly out in the world and they're, they're, they're addicted to pornography, all these things. And then with that big ego, they're thinking, well, I was raped as an eight year old. I guess it's not gonna hurt if I do that to another one in mm -hmm. Colombia, whatever. And this is what's creating this tsunami of demand. So I've come to an understanding that if I'm going to be like William Wilberforce, if I'm going to help eradicate this problem today, then I need to use the stories of darkness to catch people's attention to say, okay, let's talk about what the real problem is. How can we as a society change? And it goes back to some of the other things that we were talking about. Number one, 
you have to understand that every single one of us are divinely connected. Every one of us. There is no person anywhere that is below any anybody else. And if we can understand that we are truly connected in that beautiful energetic spirit and that we can treat each other with that level of respect and we can help each other shed the trauma of our past and hold on to this, this light that is inside of us and understand that that each one of us were born with the ability to feel and recognize the spirit of truth. And that spirit of truth, when you really tune into it, will tell you that you're not dirty because of what somebody else did to you. And you can shed the past and you can get rid of all of that. Just like you're washing water from your hands, getting washing dirt from your hands with water, you can, you can be pure. You can be clean and step forward into a place of light and love and harmony with others. And so that's what I'm hoping to do with creating this movement mm -hmm. is bring people to a place where they aren't drawn to that negativity that's, that's, that's fueling trafficking and other things like that. Why do you think so many people, you know, hold in that type of trauma um, and feeling that guilt like it was their fault? Why do you think so many people hold that in for so long before they finally, you know, express themselves? Um, Predators like to make their prey feel like it was their fault. That happens right at a young age. Yeah, yeah, you were wearing that sexy little thing, as you, you know, and, and so they, they are trying to transfer the responsibility off of themselves onto mm -hmm. somebody else. And so as a child, they soak that in. And the trauma of going through an experience like that, your brain blocks it out. And it's, it's in your subconscious mind. Your subconscious remembers everything. Every single thing that happened is all still there. But your conscious mind has put this block so that you can't feel it, you can't remember it, but it's still there. And so you're wondering, why in the world am I so closed in? Why am I scared of everything? Where is this fear coming from? And you don't know. Because it's, it happened when you were four, you, it happened when you were six, it happened when you were eight, and your conscious mind said, you know what, survival tool is, I'm going to block that out. I'm not even going to think about it, but mm -hmm. it's still there. And so it comes up in, in really low self-esteem and, and beating yourself up for everything and feeling responsibility for everything and, and holding on to that trauma. And it's years before people finally, and maybe... 52 years old, the reason by, behind it is because finally the guys who did it died, right? right? Mm -hmm. Now they're 20 years older than you, 30 years old. Now they're gone. Now you can say, okay, this is here because that fear of retribution. Chances are, as a six-year-old, as a seven-year-old, that predator was saying, you tell anybody ever and I will kill your mom or I will hurt you or I'll hurt your sister. And so subconsciously that's in there. I'm scared. I don't want my mom to be hurt, my sister to be hurt or for me to be hurt again. And so that's buried there. And once they're gone, then it's like, holy crap, I remember this. So figuring out how to help people heal from that trauma before they become contact offenders, before they pass that trauma on in the form of verbal, physical, or sexual abuse of others, I believe that that will save millions of children, not just a few thousand. Absolutely. I know we have to get ready to wrap it up shortly. I got a, I got a few more questions. Um, of all the things that you've accomplished, um, build a successful business, and, you know, help a fight for these great causes, would you say this is the, the, the greatest accolade that you have saving these children? Like, what would you say is like the thing that you're the most proud of? Truthfully? Saving these kids. Mm -hmm. On the side, just for fun, my huge accolade. You ready for this? <laughs> okay. So, you know who Henry, C Henry Cavill is, the actor who plays Superman. Okay. Right? So Henry Cavill was at, at uh, my wife, uh, Vanessa. She, uh, she's a pretty famous actress from Columbia. At one point, you couldn't go anywhere without finding her face on a poster and whatever in Columbia. She just did her first big U.S. movie. So she's a pretty well-known actress in, down there, and now she's just rising up in the U.S. She's, a, she's an assassin who kills assassins in her new movie. Mm -hmm. Well, Henry was at her work every single day. And they started a date, and then she met me. So my, my claim to fame is I stole Superman's girl. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, but, but in all seriousness... 
there is nothing that compares to to having a powerful positive impact in the lives of others and yes these child rescue missions have been the most fulfilling of anything that i've ever done more important than all the companies i've built more important than the money so fulfilling but being able to now work together as a family in being a family of healers uh, vanessa is the the executive director of the child liberation foundation um, her daughter who's now my daughter is is uh, she's been studying all around the world in different types of holistic healing and sound bowl healing and drum healing and, and breath work stuff and a lot of things that can help people get into this deep meditative theta state so that they can break free of a lot of their trauma so that's my the thing i'm most grateful for is finally being able to figure out my home life in a way where i have that peace and harmony where we can then take that energy out to help heal the world was there anyone that you that you were just wanted to make that you wanted to just make them proud of everything that you were accomplishing whether it's with your parents or your your, your wife your kids you know was there anybody that you were looking to to just make them proud because you were fighting for a great cause and you built a successful business? Was there somebody that in particular that you were looking to make proud of? Um, I always wanted to make my parents proud. But for me, success was never me against anybody else. It was always me against me, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to make me proud. I wanted to be able to look in that mirror and know that that guy was on track that that guy did everything possible and but I do have a little side story on that note which I think is important um, uh, Tony Robbins is has been such a huge supporter of this cause he got mm -hmm. behind that first foundation with the Homeland Security agent was a super huge supporter there and and uh, has has just been very vocal about it and I I remember I was at one of his uh, UPW events there was like you know eight ten thousand people in the audience and uh, I was undercover and Tony had seen some of the work that I had done and here I was uh, you know up there in the audience and, and and Tony knew I was there and he said there's somebody here I'm not gonna tell you his name not to tell you but he goes undercover and he, he told some of the stuff about my story and and he you know everybody clapped and went, but nobody knew it was me then 10 minutes later you know something else was going on and 10,000 people were going Tony Tony and I asked myself would I rather have 10,000 people saying Paul, 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 and have somebody like Tony say, yeah, that guy, I don't, I don't, I don't respect him. Or would I rather have the 10,000 people have no idea what I had done, but have Tony saying, that guy, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so for me to get to a point where I had done something with my life where somebody of that caliber, somebody that I respected that much would see me for what I had done, that that was more powerful than ten thousand people saying Paul Paul Paul. Absolutely, and you, you I think you were telling us earlier as well as uh, there's a movie coming out or is it out? Can yeah. you talk about? It? Yeah. So so that first story that I told you about in Colombia with mm -hmm. 127 children, um, we we went to uh, Paramount and Sony and a bunch of others with the story, and we decided, you know what? If you just turn it over to somebody like that, they could twist the story however they wanted. We wanted to maintain the integrity of the story itself. And so we, we found some, uh, some producers that had done some beautiful films and we put together a story. We actually took eight different rescues of different, different people, some of the, my, my other operators and stuff that all came together. We took all these stories and we put them all into one storyline. And the, the name of the movie is The Sound of Freedom. So uh, Jim Caviezel, he plays Jesus in Passion of the Christ, Count of Monte Cristo. Jim plays the part of Tim, the Homeland Security agent, who first, uh, who first brought me in with, with Sean. And it starts following his story when he was, he was in Homeland Security and some of the children that he was rescuing, etc. Halfway through it comes in my character. My character is, is Eduardo Verostegui. He's one of the more famous actors in Mexico. I was, I was with the past president of Mexico and Eduardo. Nobody, everybody wanted pictures with Eduardo. Nobody cared about the president, mm -hmm. you know. But he's, he's, um, uh, he plays, because of the fact that we filmed the movie while I was still doing Undercover, he doesn't play the part of Paul Hutchinson. He plays Pablo Delgado, the, the, the billion-dollar fund manager who, who 
risks everything to go rescue the children and eventually quits his job and does it full time. So that's his role. And we're hoping to get some distribution this year. The movie is beautiful. It's not a little indie film. We put over 13 million into production wow. into the film and it looks like a 30 40 million dollar film it's just so well done and it's going to bring beautiful awareness to the problem and and help move people in the right direction to to say hey what can we do to fix this as a as a community as a world absolutely i'm glad you um said that right at the end how, how can we all pitch in as a, as a society to help pitch in and fight this cause what what are the things that we can do to count and help help out you know, for a long time, I would tell people, go to our foundation, you know, you can go to liberateachild.org, you can go to liberatechildren.org, and you can, you know, the only way that you could really help with the rescues is if you were a former special forces guy or something like that, and you could physically go in, or if you spoke Spanish and you were a therapist, everybody else, they were, how do I help this? Now that I've come to this new realization that the only way to really fix this is to fix the cause then the best thing that people can do is look in their family and their own life and their friends, et cetera, and say, okay, where is childhood trauma happening in our own homes? And what can we do to be able to create healing for all of them? And so a lot of my new, um, I'm doing some new podcasts on specifically on healing. I have a lot of, of new material that's coming out. I have some books. My first book coming out is called, Are You Listening? With My Hand on My Heart not on my ear, you mm -hmm. know, on my heart. And that is going to help people start to tuning in to that beautiful energetic connection that they have with each other, with God, with the universe, with the world around them. And it will help in starting through that healing process. Then the next book is gonna be all on, on unwavering conviction, unwavering faith in a way that you can direct your life. Faith is not a religious thing. This is something that we can use to build our companies, to build our families, and to, to heal that kind of trauma. And then changing that perception we have of ourselves and understanding what unconditional love is, not just for other people, but most importantly for yourself. Letting go of your guilt, letting go of judgment for yourself, and tuning into that unconditional love that you need for healing that will make sure that you can then spread that to others in a way where they can start letting go of these negative behaviors that are creating trauma in others. And so uh, they, can, they can follow me. We're putting out more podcasts in the, in the near future that specifically talk about healing that trauma from within. And the, even the Child Liberation Foundation, people who are donating to that, are realize that some of that money is going still to help with rescue efforts and rehabilitation but some of it is also helping to rescue the 10 year old inside of a 30, 40, 50 year old man or woman who has dealt with that kind of trauma that we can help heal generations instead of just one. Absolutely, it's for a, a beautiful cause. Um, my, my, my final two questions as we wrap this interview up, if you could talk to your younger self and give your younger self some advice, what would you say? I would say trust the timing, trust the process, trust that, that things may not happen exactly on the path that you want, but the end goal will be beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, and it's exactly in line with what your core purpose is in making a powerful positive impact in the lives of others. Just learn to listen, learn to trust that intuitive guidance inside of yourself in every decision that you make and it will guide you in a place that will create massive abundance financially emotionally and every other way for yourself and for others what would you say you know going forward i know you, you spoke about you know the movie um your book that's coming out any other future business endeavors that um you plan to have going moving forward or, or any foundations um, what are some things that you have that you can share? Absolutely, um, absolutely. I've I've come to an understanding that this tool of changing your thoughts and tuning into intuition is not only going to help fix child trafficking. I believe that these same tools can be used to to heal the the friction between rich and poor and white and black and, 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 and left and right and all of these divisions, I believe I can help bring them together 
into a common place of love and peace. I believe that some of these tools of visualization and manifestation I can take into places where we could, we could solve poverty and hunger and, and not just show pictures of, of poverty to affluent people, but get the affluent people to write checks and create a foundation, but show pictures of affluence to those in poverty and help them believe that they can pull through that and change those thought patterns inside themselves that can help elevate them in a place where they can live in abundance in all areas of their life as well. And so moving forward, uh, we're, we're going to continue with the child rescue work. Uh, we're going to continue with the, the trauma healing, but I believe a lot of these things that I have learned in this space can truly create inner peace and prosperity with people around the world. Absolutely. Paul, I want to thank you for your time. Um, thank you for inviting us into your beautiful home. Thank you for sharing your story, your journey. Um, I want to say personally, I appreciate you for the opportunity to come on our platform. Um, and thank you for all of the work that you're doing in, in the community to you know, help people fight these traumas and help rescue so many, so many beautiful children. Um, they may not have even thought they would have had a chance to you know, see their own future. So for me personally um, and my, my business part of Calvin, we want to thank you for the time and thank you for the opportunity for everything that you're doing for us and the things that you've done um, for the community. Thank you so much. Um, before we get out of here, once again, um, can you please tell everyone how we can find you online and, and help fight these causes? Absolutely. You can, uh, you can find the Child Liberation Foundation with liberateachild.org or liberatechildren.org. Um, you can find me on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram on, on paulhutchinsonofficial.com. Uh, paulhitchinsonofficial.com or just the Paul Hutchinson official there. Somebody told me on a podcast last week that that was too long to write out. So I bought the domain uh, www.soulhealer007.com mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can type in that and right now that'll just face you towards my, my Facebook page but we're going to have, uh, have some other, other things on there that can help uh, direct you to causes that are making a difference. So go to soulhealer 7 Com. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you again for your time. Thank you for everybody who tuned into this episode. I hope you guys learned something. Hopefully you can all pitch in and help fight a beautiful cause that's well needed in our community in these trying times that we have today. But overall, just stay positive. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the Cross Line Podcast. Till next time, keep chasing your dreams. Thank you for listening.